One big question is answered. Will God really be with us? And we know it's true. And we know it's right. We know what to believe. But I, I don't know, quite often, if you're like me, I'm like the father in Mark 9 who, who cried out, I, I do believe. Do you help my unbelief? So I can understand what the Israelites must have been feeling. We know what you've done. We, we've seen your work. We, we know what you've said. But we want to know, will you really be with us. Really, this is the question that the Israelites asked throughout the book of Exodus. God's people have been crying out for 400 years of slavery, and all of the stage seems barren, blank, and dark. Is God listening? Is he here? Does he, does he know? Does he even care? Will he really be with us? And was it, what does it say in Exodus 2? The king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God heard, God remembered, God saw, and God knew. And when he raised a deliverer, Moses, he, he met him at a burning bush on the far side of Midian, not far from Mount Sinai, and the Lord told him two things from the bush. I am who I am. I'll always be with you. Exodus is about the God who makes himself known. It was never just about delivering the people from slavery. The Lord's end game was always bringing them to himself. That those covenant promises would be fulfilled. I will be a God to you. You will be my people, and, and I will be with you. Throughout the book, the presence of God is symbolized by the glory cloud, a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way by night, a pillar of fire. It was there to protect and guide them. This cloud had been with them. It settled on Mount Sinai, where Moses would meet with the Lord, the cloud of glory. The Hebrew word for glory, kabod, is the same as the word for weight or heaviness. The heaviness of God. The presence of God had been unpredictable so far since crossing the Red Sea. It has at times been distant and off limits. Only Moses can approach. They stand at a distance, reverently fearing the God of glory. And then we read about this tabernacle. The instructions for the tabernacle and repeating almost verbatim at times. God said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. This is why they built the tabernacle. God designed to give a tent for his presence, and what was with the sin of the golden calf? What was that all about? It was a failure to recognize the presence of God among them. Remember what they said, as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. We need to make something that we can see, a God that we can touch. So they put in all their gold and out came this golden calf and, and they worshiped it. And they said, behold, the God who delivered us out of Egypt. It was a direct violation of what God had intended to do by building the tabernacle, building a home where he could dwell in the very midst of his people. And then the question becomes, what now of the presence of God? Because God said, if that's what you want, that's what you'll get. I'm so angry with this people. They're so stubborn and stiff-necked. If I go with them and lead them to the promised land, I'm going to absolutely destroy them because their sin is in such a violation of my holiness. No, I won't go with them. You see the tragic irony of sin, right? The very thing that they wanted was the very thing that they were in danger of losing, God being with them. As we saw, it took a valiant intercession from Moses and great grace on the Lord's part for God to welcome them back. We see real evidence of the people's repentance not just tears and sackcloth, tearing of garments and regret, but concrete expressions of obedience, right? First, they stripped themselves of their ornaments and all that pagan idolatry. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary, they came each from the task that he was doing and said to Moses, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. Their giving was a concrete expression 
expression of their repentance. Most importantly, I think the whole section on the tabernacle is repeated twice, almost verbatim, to show how meticulously the people obeyed the commandments of God. The Spirit of God was making a point that word for word obedience is important. I tend to bend it my way here or there, tweak it a little bit so it kind of fits my, my style of living, shade it a little bit, cloud it a little bit. But this here was a newly chastened, repentant, and obedient people. And it might be short-lived, but at least for the time being, they had learned their lesson. Now they're writing things down, right? They're like, tabernacle basin? Yes, sir. Check. Just as you commanded. As we come to the end of Exodus 40, with the completion of the tabernacle, it's, it's the climax of the entire book. God can now make his home among them. And the cloud came down. In the last section, beginning in verse 34, the word cloud is mentioned in every verse. The cloud covered the tent. The cloud settled on it. Whenever the cloud was taken up, if the cloud was not taken up, and for the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, every single verse mentions this glory cloud. Think about it. What the people couldn't approach on the mountain, they now have living in their midst. They could all see it. Exodus 40 answers the one big question that's dodged the people of God throughout the book. Will God really be with us? And God gives a resounding answer, yes. And not just any God, the God, the I am who I am God, the I will be who I will be God, the I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy God, the sovereign God that dwells in the tabernacle and lives in your midst. And the question that's left to be answered is, do we have access to this God? I mean, we see that he's with us, but do we have access? Can we get in? How Will we live with him? We read in Leviticus 1.1, the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. You see, God's going to say something and it picks up right where we left off with the Lord speaking to Moses from the tent of meeting. It's no coincidence that Exodus 40 with the dwelling of God in the tabernacle is followed by Leviticus 1 and the laws for burnt offerings. That's the cliffhanger. God is in our midst. What do we do? We're still sinners. He's still holy. Leviticus 1 says you need a sacrifice. If this is going to work and God's going to dwell in your midst, you're going to need atonement. Exodus is making a way for more than just the rest of the Pentateuch, the first five books. It's It's making a way for Christ. The Lord Jesus is our Passover lamb and divine lawgiver. He's our manna in the wilderness, our water in the desert, our life-giving rock, our high priest, our mediator, our intercessor, our mercy seat, our bloody sacrifice. He's our holy tabernacle. John 1.14, I can't say it any better. And the word became flesh and tabernacled with us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Just when you thought, wouldn't it be so cool to be in the Old Testament? We could have been there. We would have seen the the glory fill that tabernacle. No, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The glory cloud took on skin and and, and bones. He slept and ate and wept and died and, and rose again. And he's coming one more time. When the curtain was torn at the crucifixion, it symbolized that it's finished. It's enough. That cliffhanger in Exodus has finally been answered. The God who dwells in our midst is now the God of open access. Not once a year by the high priest, but every moment of every day for the rest of your life. For everyone who belongs to Jesus, come in. You can go where Moses was not allowed to go. And it gets even better because Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit, the glory cloud sent from the Father and the Son, now dwells in us. We're temples of the living God. You are the tabernacle. In Christ, we not only have access to and atonement with God and can see the glory of God, but we have the very presence of God living in us. He died for us and he said, I will be your God. You will be my people. You come anytime you like and stay as long as you want. Brothers and sisters, in all the days and years ahead, I just want you to remember this. Christ died for you. God will be with you now and always to the very end of the age.